Most people have heard the accounts of how Joe Colombo and the mob influenced certain aspects of the production of Francis Ford Coppola's legendary film The Godfather. But there is a rarely discussed story of when the major actors of the film, including Marlon Brando, James Caan and Al Pacino, had dinner with the captain in the Genovese crime family. A mobster who just five years later was murdered. Let's check it out. Welcome to OC Shorts, bringing you detailed historical snapshots of the American Mafia and other organised crime. Feel free to subscribe if you like that sort of thing. Today we're going to take a quick look at the times when members of the cast of the epic Mafia movie The Godfather hung out with Pasquale Patsy Ryan Iboli, a captain in the Genovese crime family. In 1971, Actor Al Letteri, who excellently portrayed the menacing Virgil the Turk Salozzo in the movie, suggested to Marlon Brando that he should come to one of his relatives' house in Fort Lee, New Jersey, to get assistance in preparing for playing Don Vito Corleone. Apparently, being around Letteri's relatives would help Brando get the flavour. Letteri was related by marriage to the Iboli brothers, powerhouses in the Genovese crime family. Letteri put a call into his brother-in-law, Pasquale Patsy Ryan Aboli, the captain of the Genovese family's Greenwich Village crew, and he asked him if he would like to have some of the cast over for dinner. Patsy Ryan was known to be very affable and was more than happy to entertain the group of actors. Patsy Ryan's older brother, Tommy Ryan Aboli, was at the time the alleged front boss of the Genovese crime family, but still a power in his own right. Apparently, it was the fearsome Tommy Eboli who gave permission for Al Letteri to appear in the film. And so, on one night in 1971, several of the main cast members of the soon-to-be legendary movie turned up at Patsy Ryan's Fortley home in New Jersey. Through Patsy Ryan's daughter, Giovannina Bellino, we are privy to what transpired that night. The doorbell rang around 7pm. She recalls, I was 15 going on 16. I opened the front door and there was Marlon Brando, James Kahn, Morgana King, who played Corleone's wife, Gianni Russo and my uncle Al. We all went downstairs into the family room where the table was set and where we had the pool table and the bar. Gio states that she was running between the family room and the kitchen serving food and wine while the actors got to know her family. Marlon Brando loved my mum's eggplant parmigiana. I remember sitting with him on the basement steps and watching the little drip of olive oil going down his chin and telling my mother, Jean, this is the best eggplant I've ever eaten. It was a wonderful, relaxed and casual evening. I danced with James Kahn all night. I'm pretty sure the Fed who has parked up the block, this guy who was always tailing my father, got a big kick out of it. So who was Pasquale Patsy Ryan Iboli? Born in 1923, Pasquale Patsy Ryan Iboli was one of four brothers, including Tommy, Ralph and John, and they would all venture into the world of organised crime. Their eldest sibling, Tommy Iboli, known on the streets as Tommy Ryan, was actually Patsy's half-brother. And despite the over a decade age gap, the pair of elder siblings were very close. Tommy Ryan was very powerful in boxing circles and was once even the manager of Vincent Cingiganti when he was an aspiring young fighter. On January 11, 1951, Tommy Ryan Bowley leapt onto the ring at Madison Square Garden and attacked the referee, Ray Miller. Miller had stopped the fight between Ernie Durando and Rocky Castellani, who was fighting for a bowley. Castellani had taken a big hit, but survived the count. However, Ray Miller stopped the fight anyway. Allegedly, Tommy Ryan Iboli had bet $80,000 on the fight. After the fight, IBC matchmaker Al Whale stopped by Castellani's dressing room, and he was immediately attacked by Tommy Iboli and his brother Patsy. Both the Eboli brothers were arrested, 
but Al Well said that he had difficulty identifying his assailants. My glasses were knocked off and busted right away, and I couldn't see anything but a lot of fists flying. Al Well ended up in hospital with a fractured jaw and broken ribs. Both the Eboli brothers were charged with assault. The pair of brothers were heavily involved in the corruption of boxing, with Patsy telling family members, Nothing is better than a fixed fight. It just rains money. With regards to corrupting fighters, one source says, First, Patsy used his natural charm and his power of persuasion on a fighter. If that didn't work, Tommy and his crew would persuade fighters by other means. As the 1950s progressed, Pasquale Patsy Ryan Eboli would often travel to Italy as the mob's bagman to provide exiled former boss Charles Lucky Luciano with his mob proceeds. A role that his brother Tommy had allegedly previously performed himself. Patsy and Luciano became close over the course of his trips to Naples to visit the former mob powerhouse. An FBI report also states that Patsy used the trips to associate with narcotics couriers who operated between the US and Luciano. From the director of the FBI, we can read, he is a half-brother of the extremely powerful and important New York top hoodlum, Thomas Eboli, also known as Tommy Ryan. Also, according to the Bureau files, Pasquale Eboli was associating with the late Lucky Luciano in Italy, and he had been associating with people believed by the Narcotics Bureau to be couriers between the United States hoodlums and Luciano in Italy. Patsy Ryan would also relay messages and provide Charlie Luciano with updates on the underworld in New York, which in the late 1950s was in a rather precarious state, with Vito Genovese on the cusp of finalising his play for power. Tommy Ryan was close with Vito Genovese and allegedly the getaway driver when Chin Giganti shot at Frank Costello. Luciano knew of Tommy Eboli's alignment with Vito and he didn't want to put his friend Patsy in an awkward position with regards to loyalty. In the widely discredited book The Last Testament of Lucky Luciano, Charlie Lucky allegedly said he was in a hell of a spot because everything that was going on right at that time with Vito involved his brother Tommy right up to the eyebrows and I didn't want to bring no pressure on Pat to be a stool pigeon about his own brother. I sent Patsy back to New York without no messages. The kid was already in a fight with Tommy over loyalty to me and I didn't have the heart to get him involved no further. Anyway, by the early 1960s Vito Genovese had been locked up for narcotics trafficking and Tommy Ryan Eboli was now the captain of the Genovese family's Greenwich Village crew. Numerous FBI surveillance files show that they followed the Eboli brothers closely, including when the pair made trips to Las Vegas with their wives or had meetings with Anthony Tuftoni Anastasio, brother of the murdered Alba Anastasia. With Vito Genovese in jail, members of his inner circle were bumped up and tasked with the day-to-day -day running of the crime family. Depending on which source you read, at this stage, Eboli was either promoted to acting underboss or acting boss. But some reports state that in reality, it was a committee of Tommy Eboli, Jerry Katina, and Mike Miranda who actually ran things. Although some sources also add future boss Philip Benny Squint Lombardo to this group. After Tommy Eboli's promotion, he bumped up his brother Patsy to the position of acting captain of the Greenwich Village crew. This Genovese crew, along with the 116th Street crew, are credited with providing the majority of bosses and underbosses in the crime family's history. I will cover both these powerful crews and their history in more detail in a future video. So by 1964-1965, under Patsy's control in the Greenwich Village crew were names such as future consigliere Louis Bobby Manor and future boss Vincent Chin Giganti. By 1971, Vito Genovese had been dead a couple of years and his official successor was Philip Benisquint Lombardo. 
Benny Squint was very secretive and used Tommy Eboli in the position of front boss after he took over in 1969. This coincided with Patsy Ryan becoming the official boss of the Greenwich Village crew. And so back to the Godfather story. And a few weeks after Marlon Brando and James Kahn had dined with Patsy Ryan, another actor showed up with Al Letary for dinner at the Eboli house. The film's breakout star, Al Pacino. Patsy Eboli's daughter Gio recalls, I remember he was very quiet and we had to pay his cab fare. Gio's mother made linguine with clam sauce for the future Oscar winner. Pacino's role in the film required him to speak Italian at times. But he was New York born and the Italian language wasn't his strong point. So he'd come with Letteri to practice for the famous restaurant double murder scene of Salazzo and police captain McCluskey. My dad and Uncle Al spoke Italian fluently, Gio says. They drank plenty of wine that night. My brother joked at the time, how's this kid going to get the lines down after they go through six bottles? When the scene was filmed, Pacino was still struggling with the Italian. And so they reworked the scene so that Salazzo and Michael Corleone started off in Italian, but then Pacino's character breaks into English to emphasize to Salozzo the famous line, what I want, what's most important to me, is that I have a guarantee, no more attempts on my father's life. On July the 16th, 1972, the following year, Tommy Ryan Eboli is gunned down in Crown Heights, Brooklyn. Some speculate that the killing was ordered by Carlo Gambino after Eboli failed to pay back a $3 million loan for a drug trafficking operation but the motive for his murder was most likely due to an internal Genovese power struggle. And then, four years later, Pasquale Patsy Ryan Eboli disappeared. His car was found with the keys in the glove box parked at Kennedy Airport. He was never seen again. There was no conclusion as to why Patsy Ryan was whacked. Some speculate that even four years on, it's because he was seeking revenge for his brother's death. But who knows? Tragically, Gio's uncle, Al Letteri, died of a heart attack in 1975, at the age of just 47. If you're interested in some of the books used as sources for this video, then I've left links in the description and the top comment below. I hope you found that interesting. Thanks for watching.